Hey everyone, and welcome to day nine, the final day of Food Addiction Recovery Week on Chef AJ Live. We save the best for last. We have a heady a heavy hitter in the field of beating food addiction, Dr. Joel Furman. I'm sure he needs no introduction, but in case this is the first video you've seen of him, he is a multiple New York Times bestselling author, I believe seven times now. But in the plant-based space, he's really one of the few that really not only understands and acknowledges that food addiction is a disease, but actually treats it and has written a wonderful book about it called Fast Food Genocide, which I really recommend you read, and I will link to both in the show notes and in the chat. One of my favorite people to interview, a wealth of information. Please welcome Dr. Joel Furman. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you. Always have fun talking to you too. Well, you know, Dr. Furman, you probably know this, but not everybody believes in food addiction as a disease. Well, food addiction is, you know, look, food addiction is ubiquitous. The whole population is, addict, is addicted. I mean, most of the vast majority of people are addicted to something. I mean, I don't know if, whether it's a semantical argument, whether you call it a disease or not, you know, whether you call being overweight a disease, eating junk food a disease, food addiction a disease. I don't, I don't really need to get into that a discussion, what we call it, but what we know is it's hurting people's lives. And the drive to overeat calories occurs because we don't eat, most people don't eat the amount of calories they need. They recreate with food and they use food in a self-destructive manner. So whether you call it, they're self-destructing, they're harming their own future health, longevity, and mental function with food. And I call it food addiction. And if a person chooses not to, you know, it's fine with me. Do you think if it had a, a fancier name that it might be more well accepted and something that like doctors could monetize on with a drug or a, a procedure? Well, they kind of do, don't they? That's what doctors do. In other words, they have something they can measure, like they invented a machine called a DEXA scan. And now we can measure people's bone density. So now we're going to have a drug which we could treat the numbers on the DEXA scan. And that's how bisphosphonates arose because with the DEXA scan and the bisphosphonates arose simultaneously because now we can pick a number on the DEXA scan, which means you have to be treated with a drug. The drug, you know, so, and of course the drugs are um, like any other drug. They're poisonous. They cause dangerous side effects. And it's better not to use drugs. It's better to use lifestyle medicine and change in your habits to fix the problems. It's, whether it's blood pressure, blood glucose, or cholesterol, doctors treat what they can measure, usually what they can measure in the blood. And even a cholesterol level is only maybe one of 30 parameters that affects your risk of heart disease. And that's the one they can treat. That's the one they have a drug for. It doesn't work that effectively because you have 29 other parameters they're not treating. But it's much more important to treat the body weight than to treat the cholesterol level, treat the blood pressure. It's much more important to get to a favorable body weight because it's the food that led to that body weight and it's the biochemical effects of having excess fat on the body that causes all these biological pathologies that develop, accelerates biological pathologies. And yes, um, I'm suggesting that the food climate in America is such that people are ubiquitously deficient in nutrients and it becomes almost impossible to control the caloric drive when you're nutritionally deficient, especially in phytochemicals and antioxidants. Fiber also plays a role in modulating appetite. But people are so confused about dieting and losing weight that they're in a vicious cycle, a merry-go-round, or you can say a roller coaster of ups and downs. And they've gotten so much poor information. They're, a lot of them have checked out, given up, and just eat all day long because nothing works for them and they don't understand that. And so that's where my, I could say, field of expertise or specialty is focused on in the last two decades, enabling people to make sufficient lifestyle change to achieve a normal weight and maintain it. And the key here is to maintain it. So to, to, to develop a life that they can stay living with and get off the roller coaster of yo-yo dieting. I, I love, you know, I, my first introduction to you, I believe was in about 2008 and it was with, I, I don't know if it was a DVD or an audio CD, I think it was called Nutritional Excellence. And I used to listen to it in the car. You remember when we used to be able to put things in our, in our car. And one of the things you said over and over is that as long as you under eat on nutrients, you're always going to overeat on calories. And that really stuck with me because there are many people that are vegan, but they're not on a health promoting diet and, and hence overweight as well. But I don't think everyone understands that concept. Yes, the concept is very broad, very confusing, because 
That's right. If you don't focus on the quality of what you're eating, you can't adequately control the quality, the quantity, right? If you don't focus on quality, you can't focus on quantity. And your body instinctually will desire less calories when your biological needs for nutrients are met. And I'm also suggesting here that not only do we need micronutrients like vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants, sufficient amount of these micronutrients to control our appetite, but I'm also suggesting that when you go on crash diets, juice diets, and fasting diets, when your calories get too low, it also can induce you emotionally to want to, even though it'll slow your metabolic rate down for a few months, too, too low, slow your metabolism too low. So you'll gain weight easier, but then emotionally they can trigger you into binge eating behaviors and trigger your emotional eating behaviors with, because the deprivation then can lead to more emotional overeating and then people gain weight back again. And so for, for a lot of individuals, um, dieting too extreme, cutting back calories too low can lead to a yo-yo process, which then they can, they've slowed the metabolic rate excessively. And then they're consuming too many calories for their new metabolic rate and they start gaining weight again. And anytime you're gaining weight, you are, unless you're malnourished or too excessively thin, but anytime you're gaining weight, then you're in a process that's leading to the disease, that's increasing inflammation, um, making your body more saturated, creating more um, pro-inflammatory compounds and raising cholesterol. So gaining weight is detrimental, raising insulin resistance. Gaining weight is dangerous. So I'm saying right now, let's say you, a person came to my retreat and lost 50 pounds, right? They're still 50 pounds overweight now, right? And they go home and they go to Vegas or a cruise and they gain back 10 pounds. So now they only lost 40 pounds. In that rapid regain of 10 pounds at the cruise or on the, at Vegas, they're in worse health now, worse health than they were when they were 50 pounds heavier because they just rapidly put 10 pounds on the body. And the reoccurrence of rapid regain of weight is biologically damaging to the body. And it can precipitate a heart attack or a stroke or some other disease process by gaining weight that quickly. And that's what we know. Most heart attacks occur around holidays, around people come back on vacations and they binge eat. And so binge eating and rapid regain is dangerous. So anything you do that's going to precipitate you emotionally to fly off the handle and binge eat and regain weight is not good for your health. We want to lose weight in a manner so people learn the method and the the, you know, the, the psychologically, the intellectual knowledge and the psychological knowledge change, they have to change emotionally so they can re keep eating that way and continue it long-term. So I'm trying to teach people changes they can maintain for the rest of their life. And that takes a lot of information and education, not just about food and nutrition, but also about philosophy and psychology as to what drives overeating behaviors, because it's all intertwined. You know, we mentioned that maybe food addiction wasn't a good name for what might be a disease in some people's view, because you really can't be addicted to food and eating. You have to eat to live is one of the names of your best-selling books. But do you think it's particular foods that people can be addicted to, like processed foods, for example, or the chemicals that are added to these foods like sugar, oil, and salt, maybe flour, caffeine, those kind of things, alcohol? Of course, absolutely, of course. But let's go to the base, to one of the simplest concepts here. And that is the caloric rush that enters the bloodstream. So certain foods are digested very rapidly and they can put a, a huge amount of calories into the blood all at once. Particularly, we're talking about sweets, um, high glycemic carbohydrates, particularly white products made from white flour, like bread and bagels and pizza and Italian bread and things like that. Um, sugar, honey, maple syrup, and also oils. Oils can go into your bloodstream within three to five minutes. We say from the lips to the hips in three minutes flat. You know, but, but I'm saying right now that the rush of calories into the bloodstream, such a high level of calories in the bloodstream all at once, that has the effect to turn on and overly stimulate dopamine centers in the brain, the same areas of the brains that are stimulated by opiates and narcotics. So if you're eating you know, um, fruit, fruits and vegetables, it's hard to put in so many calories all at once because even when you're eating something calorically concentrated like a nut or a seed, the calories are digested over a period of hours and beans are digested over hours, not over minutes. So the word glycemic load of the meal has to do with how fast the carbohydrates are broken down and into the bloodstream. And over time, the overstimulation of the fat calories and the carbohydrate calories 
makes the brain dopamine insensitive and the level of calories the brain now desires becomes higher and higher. And this is definitely a form of addiction because it's just the same biochemical effects as drug addiction does or caffeine addiction or alcohol addiction where people are not feeling well if they don't overconsume something or consume something unhealthy. So I'm saying here that, um, that in America, most of the fat intake in America comes from oils or animal fats, butter, you know, bacon, or the fat on meats. And those fats are rapidly digested and enter the bloodstream at a high concentration, increasing a person's desire for excess calories. And they do that in conjunction with high glycemic carbohydrates, French fries, pretzels, bagels, you know, pizza, burgers. They, they eat a lot of foods that are high glycemic. And that combination of calories into the bloodstream is such a rush, turns people into food addicts that are not satisfied with lower amounts of calories. So I'm saying right now that when you eat natural foods, the calories don't come into the bloodstream so quickly. So you're not going to be, become dopamine. Um, dopamine is not going to control your behavior. But let's say you go the other way and you say, okay, well, I'm just going to eat foods with a very low caloric density. I'll just, I won't even have nuts. I'll just have like, you know, rice and and um, vegetables, and then you, it's possible with a certain people, and a lot of people too, but to, they can get their caloric density too low. So they're overly dieting or cutting back calories. So they, they don't have enough caloric density in the bloodstream. So two extremes, both the low caloric density in the bloodstream can lead to overeating behavior. And people now eat till they're stuffed. And they eat till they stretch their stomach out till they're overly full because their caloric density of the meal is so low that in order to meet their need for calories, they have to eat larger amounts of food. And now they become addicted to eating larger amounts of food. And it's not good for your health, long-term digestive capacity, digestive ability, organ function, if you're gonna eat till you're full all the time and stuff your stomach and make your stomach distend. And you can see some of these people, they like, they're not like large muscles, they're not like robust looking, but they have still a big stomach sticking out. You know, they're like overeating, even though they might have been out of eating on calories. So it's, so we're trying to get this perfect balance. So you're losing, you're getting the right amount of calories. You're not getting calories that are overly, um, you can say fast, I call them fast food calories, not referring to the foods coming from a fast food restaurant, but just foods that are digested rapidly. And so you're eating healthfully, you're getting the right balance of calories in your bloodstream, but you're undershooting by a little bit your biological needs. So you're steadily losing weight, but not undershooting your caloric needs excessively that's going to cause you to be, then kind of rebound with, with, over, with binging or emotional deprivation. If you go too far, you get to emotional deprivation, and then people can't maintain it, and they come back and they binge eat. And we use caloric density. We're having a diet with a relatively favorable caloric density, but we don't take that feature and make it excessive either because that doing that excessive can also lead to overeating and meals that are too large. So it's a little bit complicated. And now we have to use those, some of these basic information and intertwine it with why people emotionally overeat and why they psychologically fail on diets, which is another different subject that um, intertwines with the, a lot of the physical feelings. And we even discussed the physical sensation of, of detoxification, where people get shaky and weak and headache and fatigue. So fatigue drives tremendous overeating behavior because pe when people don't keep the digestive tract busy all the time, their body goes into a repair or detoxification mode that leads to them feeling fatigued. And eating stops the detox and makes them no longer feel fatigue. And then people think that fatigue is a sign of hunger and the feeling that there's fatigue means they need to eat more food. And it drives, so many people are driven to overeating because they're eating first, they think they need to keep their energy up, you know? Yeah, this, I was going to say you should write a book on this, but you've written several. Uh, and it's funny, Dr. Furman, I, I love all your books, but Fast Food Genocide is my favorite book of yours because you really go into the ramifications of how these foods are harmful, not just people who are overweight, but people of normal weight. Yes, it affects, and I try to discuss in that book how people admit or they agree that it's affecting your body and causing diabetes and heart disease, but they don't see how it's affecting your brain and creating... Um, agitation, tendency towards anger, more um, lo loss of creativity, loss of intelligence. So we're saying that people's ability to be fooled and tricked, their ability to weigh evidence, um, all these things are affected by what we eat. 
So what a poor diet makes for a poorly functioning vein, which, which predisposes you to depression and makes you somewhat dysthymic. So I'm saying when you're on a poor diet, it affects the brain. So you have a degree of dysthymia, which means you're not excited and passionate about life. You're not fully manifesting your creativity every day. You don't get out of bed in the morning. Oh, I got to do that. You know, all excited about what you're going to accomplish today. You're kind of just living to make some money so you can buy more food and imbibe in substances or go after your narcissistic bents. You know, we know some people just live because they're they're not that healthy and they're not that passionate about life or about people, about emoting. They don't feel and care for people in the natural world. And they're, they're not really driven by their passions. They're just driven by how you can say, trying to impress other people and, and in some way um, stroke their narcissism. And I'm saying the fast food has something to do with it. Because the more you become addicted, the more you become narcissistically concerned with your own internal world. And the external world becomes as gifts becomes gray. So when, when you become a drug addict, when you're a cocaine addict or a heroin addict or even an alcoholic, you can hurt people even need, without even realizing it. Because you're not when you're when you're seeking drugs, you're not thinking about your effect on other people and whether you're having a positive effect on them or goodwill. Your drug seeking behavior overtakes the purpose of your brain. So you're no longer altruistic or motivated by, by, the, by feeling good about yourself, by having goodwill for the natural world. What I'm saying is, right now, I know it's kind of a complicated concept, but I'm saying the world that begins when our fingertips end, there's an external world that includes nature, things, people, animals, and our care for ourselves and our own emotional happiness is based on, yes, caring for ourselves, but also based on how we see we care of how we see ourselves caring for things that are not ourselves. Did you follow that? So we have to be able to emote and have feelings of love and like and appreciation and gratitude for things outside our own immediate body. And when you become physically addicted to, sub to substances, your ability to be happy because of your care for things that are not you, including the natural world and people and emotions and, and feelings becomes lessened and your own drive to consume addictive substances becomes a central um, consumption, a central activity of the, brain, of the human brain. That becomes more important than other things, making you more narcissistically involved and making you more selfishly involved with your life. And you can't really realize the full humanity that you were meant for. You're not the full, the best version of you. And I'm saying that with a food addict, a lot of them fail because we've even monitored which people who lose weight and learn this information, who, who is more likely to fail and who is more likely to succeed? And we find that the reason people fail often is from peer pressure, from their social context, their workers, their family, their friends, they're feeling they're, they're affected by what other people think of them. And when you are more centrally involved with your core of your narcissistic wanting people to approve of you, when you're more involved with not how you care for others and how you feel for others and how accomplished and creative you are and having goodwill for the external world, when that's not your biological, when that's not your philosophy of life and you become more consumed with meeting your own um, addictive needs, then you become, you get more involved with how people are looking at you and thinking about you. And you become more improved with, with requiring other people's approval and wanting to go after that kind of um, societal norm. And, and the societal norms in America contribute to that because you know how right through childhood, we're all socialized compared to Bhutan or Thailand. Well, here we're all socialized to think, oh, have the best job, make the most money, be the best in sports, go to the best school, get, you know, look the best, wear the most expensive clothing. You know, look, it's all about superficial things to try to make yourself feel that you're important or as good or better than other people. And that impacts you, that kind of philosophy you're raised with impacts the narcissistic tendencies exacerbated by food addiction, addictions in general. And then it makes people unable to tolerate not being approved of by the external world when they have to eat differently from them. And they, they can't be a leader, they have to be a follower. And in order to succeed to get rid of food addictions, you have to become a leader, not a follower. And to become a leader, not a follower, you have to change the way you philosophically go after pleasure. 
because you're not going to please people when you when you're different from them and you have to take a leadership role in how you're caring for your health and go after pleasure in a different manner that's healthier for the long term anyway it doesn't lead to ultimate happiness to go after pleasure with narcissistic pursuits so it's all very complicated you know it is. It's, it's, I think it's multifactorial. And you talk yeah. about the brain and, you know, I've had conversations with people that suffer from actual drug addictions and alcoholism, and they feel like that we're making too big of a deal about this because this isn't a real addiction. But yesterday, I don't know if you're familiar with Tim Kaufman from Fat Man Rants. He used to weigh over uh, 400 pounds. He's a plant-based athlete. And he said that it, the, it, food has been a bigger battle for him and a bigger challenge than when he had to get off fentanyl. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, number one, it's a food addiction is not only real, but the whole population is addicted. So, of course, the population that's addicted and that can't do anything about it because they don't know how or want to resolve their addiction behavior, they are in a place called cognitive dissonance, which means it creates anxiety or some negative in the negative feelings if they try to uncover or get to the base of their issues as to why they overeat. So they'd rather just keep it hidden. So therefore, an adult mother or father can bring donuts to, ch to the soccer games, put a soda in their kid's mouth, or feed their kids hot dogs. We know that these things are class 1A carcinogens. We know that they're outlawed even into school systems in Europe. We know that they, you know, that we're giving children obesogenic foods and that are carcinogenic, but why do parents still do it? And because they're still doing it because they're in a state of denial. They're in a state of denial because it's causing them stress to think about these foods are harmful. And so they really want to believe on, a, on some level that what they're doing is not harmful, that disease is genetic. It's not harmful to be overweight. It's okay to be overweight. They shouldn't be made to feel like it's wrong or bad, and they shouldn't have to do anything about it. They sh this is just the, and we know, so there's a movement. You could say there's a, a movement in America um, now to make being overweight the norm or the acceptable norm. And, uh, and they don't want doctors to even bring it up and weigh people when oh they come God. in for a medical visit. Did right? you see the little clip from Bill Maher that I sent you? Oh, I, I enjoyed that. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the part he said is like, you go to the dentist, but, but don't check my teeth. Like these people are getting, they're buying these cards that say, do not weigh me unless it's medically necessary. And it's usually medically necessary, maybe not like a dermatologist, but for most doctors, that's important information. It's the, one, it's, the mo it's the most important medical parameter is how much body fat you have on your body is the most thing because it feeds the growth of every other disease you could develop. But the problem with the doctor pursuing that avenue is that they don't, they're, the drugs don't really work that well to treat. They don't have a drug that really effectively treats it. So the, and most people have given up on, a, on that they want to lose weight or can lose weight. And the recurrent failure of attempting to lose weight makes them give up, check out, and they don't want to address this or have the doctor address it. So I understand the need to not weigh them if they're not going to address this, they're not going to do anything about it, they don't want to do anything about it, they're not going to listen to the doctor, and the doctor is giving them ineffective advice. On the other hand, if they could get effective advice, you know, listen to all these lectures that you, I mean, these um, interviews you've done, or, or read some of my books, or study, you know, the, if they could get effective advice, then it would be better to, to weigh them and to encourage them and motivate them to make a change and to realize that, that getting out of that um, narrow view where they can't possibly change, they might as well accept them for themselves who them who they are, and they and they don't and they're not going to do anything to try to work to get out of this issue. It's like a person, you know, it's different. It's not like you're um, there's something inherently in you that can't be changed. You're not going to you don't want to reflect negative on a person with a handicap a person with a biological defect, a person with a different skin tone, a person with a different um, look or a person with a, you know, we don't want to, um, a person with a different um, sexual preference. We don't want to um, negatively look on people negatively if, on things that can't be changed, but something that, that's the person's self-destructive behavior that can be changed, then goodwill would be to creatively in some way show the person that they're cared about they're loved and that they can be, they can be, have a better, happier life, not just healthier. Cause a lot of people will say, I'll just die younger. I'd rather be happy and eat whatever I want and die younger, but they're really affecting their brain negatively and causing themselves to be, feel ill, sickly, and not be as happy as they could if they were healthier. Do you think though, that there could be something 
in these foods that is affecting their brain, that makes it affecting maybe the judgment center that makes it hard for them to stop. Yes. So that's the, you know, that's where we have to get to people to change the, the what they're eating as a means. So if they're not willing to change what they're eating, you can't cut back on the amounts. So of course, you know, and, and we're also, um, there's a lot of, we were saying this is multifactorial, including the fact that people are eating plastic, you know, and taking in endocrine disruptors from, but so there's a lot of complicated factors. And we say that some of these endocrine disruptors and fast foods contain obesogenic chemicals that make it harder for the body to release its fat. And that's where we're trying to get rid of the obesogenic chemicals out of the body by healing the body and detoxifying it by eating cruciferous vegetables and onions and mushrooms and flax seeds. And we're giving people foods and, and arugula. And you know, we're giving people foods that aid in the body's natural detoxification channels, flooding the body with nutrients and removing some of the obesogenic chemicals that are now impregnated in their tissues and their fat supply. Because the fat supply is the primary garbage dump of the body. The body stores fat soluble toxins that are attracted to and stored in the fat supply. And as you lose weight, those things are released. And sometimes the release of those chemicals from the fat supply can cause negative symptoms, including an itchy skin rash. And we said before fatigue, even a feeling of a flu-like syndrome. And, and sometimes people can feel um, in, a, in a brain fog, in a, you know, in a mental fog when they're trying to but they got to go through that period of a week or two onto a healthy lifestyle to enable the body to plow through those negative withdrawal symptoms, which now enhances the ability of the body to stick with a healthy diet. And I'm suggesting that I'm not recommending people like go on a water fast or a juice fast to do the detox. The extremeness of it ex slows metabolism back too much and leads to and, and plays with the brain and man has too high of a chance of leading to more emotional overeating behavior after the caloric deprivation is, is passed. It's better to use food to lose weight, you know, and so, and, and people can lose a lot of weight if the body is very heavy, they can lose a lot of weight quickly, but they're still eating a lot of pretty good amount of healthy food and flooding their body with good amount of nutrients. And I think a lot of the experts in the food addiction space agree with you that it's different if somebody goes to True North to water fast because they have a disease, they may be overweight or not, but a lot of them say it's it's not a good idea to fast food addicts, that it actually creates a rebound effect in some of them. That's water. right. I mean, I might be, I fast a person who's like not overweight, who has asthma, let's say. I want them to eat healthy and get to a normal weight. And once they get to a normal weight, I might fast a person who has asthma to make them break up their... Um, get them off their medications or a person with inflammatory bowel disease. I have some people fasting um, two to three days per month or two to three days every six weeks to keep their inflammatory bowel disease under check. But we're not fasting them to solve their obesity or food addiction. There's too many possibilities of things going wrong if you're doing that. You do much more effective um, results if you eat, if you feed them. You know, it's funny. I just had a guy left here. He was here for three months and he was, you know, he was three, 250. He must have been about must've been about 450 pounds, I think, when he got here. And he lost hundred pounds in the three months. So he lost um, about 35 pounds a month. So he left here losing hundred pounds. Now I would normally have thinking, I would normally have thought that losing three hundred pounds in three months is more than 10 pounds a week is too much weight loss. That's too much, too extreme. But for him, I was monitoring what he was eating and, and his exercise in the pool. And he wasn't eating too little amount of calories. His just body was so healthy that he was eating so healthfully, but he was dumping a large amount of um, calories without him restricting going below 1500 calories a day. So he wasn't extremely, but he still lost hundred pounds in three months. And now of course we're monitoring him when he's home and he's following the program and still losing, not as fast at that rate, but he's still, he's now, I think about anyway. So he still needs to lose another hundred pounds, obviously. But some of these people lose weight very rapidly, but it's not too rapidly. Most people need to keep the weight loss within that two to three pounds a week window. If with him, he's under, he's a, you know unusual circumstance um, individual because he was so overweight. But most people, they they can control their diet and control the amount of food in that two to three pound window. And I say to people, you know, you you know, I use that word nutritarian, meaning a super healthy eater, following a diet that's um, designed to maximize human longevity and slow aging. So I say you're a nutritarian when you're at an ideal weight, 
And if you're overweight and not losing weight, then you're not on a nutritarian diet. Because the nutritarian diet has to do with, the, with what you're eating and how much you're eating. Both things have to come into play. We eat the right food so we can eat the right amount of foods. But we, so there are people who emotionally overeat even on good food, right? Even on healthier food. And so, and that you, you're, you can be a nutritarian if you're overweight, if you are steadily losing weight in the direction of your normal weight. Then you, but if you're a nutritarian and not losing, if you're not losing weight, then you're doing something wrong. You're either eating the wrong food or you're, or you're eating too much of it. And you're not doing what's right for you. Because what I'm saying right now is that every person is different. This person lost 100 pounds in one in three months on 1,500 calories a day. And for another person, they might even lose on 1,500 calories a day. That could be too many calories for them. So we don't even know if that's the right amount of calories for this overweight woman, let's say, who now is five foot one and weighs 180 pounds. It was a very slow metabolic rate. Maybe she needs 1,200 calories a day. But I'm saying that's okay because we can tweak the food the amount of greens, the amount of salad, we can, we can adjust the caloric concentration and density of her meals so she can get to the exact perfect diet for her so she loses weight steadily and makes it maintainable long-term. So I'm saying right now, if you're not losing weight, you have to make some adjustments and make those adjustments so you lose weight moderately. And then so something that you can maintain, then you can maintain it long-term because then when they do it moderately, they're doing it without... Um, without excessively slowing down the metabolic rate. We do want the metabolic rate to be slowed, by the way. This idea that we want to, that people are trying to raise their metabolic rate, that's just craziness. There's no, you can't, but we want to, because we slow the metabolic rate, we slow the aging process, but we only, we only want to slow it a little bit. We don't want to slow it excessively. Absolutely. Let me just read some of the nice comments. And first, I want to thank Karen for the super chat donation. You have so many friends like Amy, who says Dr. Joel Furman rocks. You have uh, just uh, so many people that say, oh, this, Kathy, this man has so much wisdom. I love listening to him. Colleen, this has been the best week on Chef AJ Live and on and on. Uh, Bethany agrees with you. She says feeding obesity is selfish. It's hard to admit. She really appreciates your talk. Dr. Furman, the a lot of the doctors in the plant-based world are okay with sugar and salt and flour, a little or a lot. But what I really love about the doctors we had on this week, like you and Dr. Esser, Dr. Sabatino, Dr. Goldhammer, you came from the NHA, you know, the nat the natural hygiene movement, where right. you really didn't think of those as food, you thought of those as chemicals. And I'm wondering They're what drugs. Part yeah, drugs, exactly. Mm -hmm. So not, I mean, one could ostensibly boil a piece of meat without, I mean, people wouldn't, but I'm saying one could, if they wanted to boil a piece of chicken, eat it without all the sugar, fat, and salt, but processed food really couldn't exist without that. That's correct. And, you know, um, so I always said that, you know, lots of people in the health food and natural food and even the health movement, they want to appeal to the masses. They want to come up with recommendations that everybody will like them and they won't offend anybody. And those are the diets that get the highest rating by U.S. News and World Report, like, for example, the ones that nobody is offended. You can still have your cheese and you can still have your salt and you can still have your oil, and still, right? And the diets, let's say, style that I recommend isn't going to become rated that high because their criticism of it will be it's too strict. People aren't, can't, everybody, people aren't going to do it. And two, it's too radical for most people, right? And, and I'll say, well, you know, that's not the whole purpose isn't to please them. Isn't it a popularity contest? We're not running for president. We're trying to give people, explain to them what's the healthiest way to live and what's the most successful way they can keep the weight off for the rest of their life and what's going to maxly keep them healthy in their later years and prevent cancer and heart disease. So what? So my, my niche, and of course, some of the other people you mentioned, we're trying to design what's ideal for people to do, not appeal to the most people possible. So they're right that the diets that I'm recommending would not be rated in the top five, let's say because it's not gonna to appeal to a large number of people. We can name other people, other doctors, which we know who are very popular, who try to appeal to a larger audience. They wanna bring people in and not offend anybody. And, they'll, and they call that, and, and they do it, and they improve the diet towards what we're recommending, but only a little bit, but they, do, they use baby steps to get here so people don't feel that they, they can be offended. The only problem with those things is you're still feeding people's addictive tendencies and giving them the, the drug-like effect of these substances that makes it more likely for them to fail. And also when, you, when you're trying that hard to diet and eat healthfully and you don't see any benefit, when your blood pressure doesn't normalize, 
when your cholesterol stays high, when you still have headaches all the time, when you're still bloated and you still have fatigue and you don't see your weight coming down, then people give up, they throw in the towel because they don't see results. And when you do something that's more, um, you could say considered radical, but more lifespan promoting a more healthier diet, then you can see better results and people will stick with it because they like the results they're getting. I say, I make this very stupid statement because everybody tries to disagree with this. A diet that is healthier is less. I know it. Go ahead. It's funny. Okay. Uh, how could I, I changed it around, but here it is. <laughs> a diet that's healthier is healthier than one that is less healthy. I just, you know, I might change it around, but you get the idea. Everybody wants to say that their diet, that's not quite as healthy, is just as healthy. Isn't that they want to have you believe? It's just as healthy to have a little bit of salt, just as healthy to have a little bit of sugar, just as healthy to put oil on your food, just as healthy not to eat nuts, just as healthy to do, you know, it's whatever it is they're not doing, it's just as good that way, right? Because they're, they're trying to make their, it seem like it doesn't matter. But these little nuances do matter. When you, if you really want to look at maximizing human health into your quality of your life between 90 and 105 years old, and a lot of people aren't interested in that. So that's fine. They don't have to be this healthy, you know, and they could take, they could take, they could gamble with their high health or gamble with their future life. But when people get more solid information, that's not based on an individual's, let's say, opinion so much as it is based on an overwhelming amount of evidence in conjunction with experience, clinical experience and and, um, and logic. So we're talking about an overwhelming amount of evidence. So then we, we modify and we learn and we grow and we eventually come to a, something that works better for people as a result of putting together a lot of evidence from various sources to give people as much possible help as they can. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you're my 1,135th show today. So I've interviewed a lot of doctors. 1,000? Yeah. 1,135 today. Wow. Yeah. That's and amazing. I know, and I haven't missed a day since I started. And it's, a lot of them have been doctors and mostly plant-based doctors. And it's not that they necessarily disagree with you, but they're treating patients and they say, you know, they can't make them do this. They have to meet them where they are. And I think that people sometimes can have success without doing it the way we advocate. But I think for food addiction, it pretty much has to be your way, Dr. Goldhammer's way, doc, you know, the way that you guys are teaching it in order for it to be effective. Because I think that little bit of sugar, that little bit of salt, that little bit of caffeine and chocolate and flour and alcohol that they're including in an otherwise healthy plant exclusive diet is the reason that they're always having compulsions for to eat more and cravings. We know that's the case. But let me be real clear here. So people can put this into numbers. Those people who have their patients baby step their way and don't want to give them such a hard line, that does work better with some people because some people will reject the hard line and just not do anything if you give them too much. But we're saying that for most people with serious addiction, trying to motivate that person to do this 100% and not dabble in, in their um, addictive foods increases the probability of them staying with it and getting results. So the percentage of people that you can help that come to see you with overweight conditions is enhanced by giving people a more clear guidelines and more clear boundaries. When you make the boundaries a little softer, you're still going to help some people. So we're not saying that those, those doctors or physicians or experts aren't helping anybody. But my experience has been, and I've been doing this for more than 40 years now, and I've used this as my um, primary um, interest of, of, of research is that the percentage of people you can help is enhanced by having clear boundaries. And it doesn't mean so they're not helping people, but I don't want to see any people fail. So when a person invests the money, let's say, to come to my retreat, they've invested a lot of money and a lot of time in their life. So I don't want to gamble with the fact that they're going to leave and blow it and get their weight back and lose their whole. So we want to make sure they have the skills, the emotional skills, and the clear exact clarity on what they should eat and how much they should eat so they can, can do this with the girl go home. So what we've done is we didn't guarantee them that they're not they're gonna succeed because there's a lot of other pressures and people don't, every person doesn't quit smoking and every person doesn't go on to healthy eating once they learn all the information. But we increased the probability of them being successful. And now we have a vast majority of those people being successful now with what we're doing. Whereas when we gave them information at a week conference, let's say, then we had, when Whole Foods, let's say Whole Foods Market gave us like a hundred sickly overweight people and put them in a hotel with us for a week and we trained them for a week and we sent them out. We tracked those of them that took what they learned and, and lost weight and got healthy and those that didn't. 
And we found that those that didn't do well, usually had, we tracked the reasons, was peer pressure, mostly peer pressure, and they didn't fit socially into their social environment when they went home. And what I'm saying right now, over the years, we've radically enhanced the percentage of people that stay successful with the program because of what we're talking about now, of the, all these different issues put together, including the fact that um, unclear boundaries may reduce the probability that you're going to help, that you're going to be able, this person to stick with it. And you would think it would be the opposite. It seems more, it seems more like, um, you know, this, you know, people would think more likely, they're going to most likely think, oh, if I do it that strict, I'm going to fall off and never be able to stay with it. So I'm going to just do it less strict and I'll stay with it long term. But in most cases, that dabbling in the unhealthy food stimulates their brain centers to want them more. And then they're always stressed out deciding what to eat and how much to eat. And they're always getting signals that are biologically driving them to those foods and wanting to eat more. So you kept this person in this addictive mentality and, and physically addicted. It's like having the alcoholic, that, you know, drink alcohol on the weekends. And some people could do that. Some people can, who have trouble with alcohol can just drink a couple of glasses a week and that's okay with them. They can do it. But the majority of alcoholics do better if you take the alcohol out completely. We do a highlight reel every week. And I can tell you what you just said is going to make it. The da- I always tell people you can't dabble in addiction or weight loss. You, you can't dabble. I love that you use that word. Thank you for so much for saying that. You know, the, the, I, I completely agree with you because you, we, if, if somebody can have a little of this, they're pro- they probably don't have a problem. Right. But most people can't. It's like Dr. Goldheimer says, if you could have done controlled it, you would have controlled it, but you can't. So it's not you. So stop it. So <laughs> <laughs> right. I, people come to see me as a patient. I say, well, don't decide what you should eat and what you like to eat, what you think you should, what you learn you should eat, what you because you, that didn't work for you, did it? You making those decisions. Now, just for now, let me make the decisions on what you're going to eat. And let's see how that goes. You know, and, and test me out so to see if I'm really right or wrong. And you, I'm saying to you, your diabetes is going to go away. Your blood pressure is going to normalize. You're going to drop 20 pounds this month. And let's just see if it works. And then we can talk about how we're going to make this process, this diet taste so incredibly delicious that you're not going to be doing any, not going to think about any other way of eating. And of course, I wouldn't dabble in those foods myself because I don't enjoy them. Yeah. Because I enjoy... My, the foods I'm used to and the recipes we've designed. And I enjoy feeling so well that I wouldn't think of doing that. You couldn't get 10 men to tie me down to a chair and push that stuff into my mouth. I walk through the airports and smell the chocolate chip cookies and the pretzels and the pizza and just look at it as people like shooting up with drugs. It's kind of disgusting to you. Yeah. Why would you know? And that's how we have to develop. We have to get rid of a food addiction. We have to get to a person to change the way they see everything, how they see the world how they see the clouds, how they see nature, how they're looking at their own self-esteem and how they see food as being, and how they really see caring for themselves. They're mindfully now behaving in a manner that's in their own best interest all the time. Because why should a person logically not behave in their own best interest? Things that benefit their own happiness. So we, 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 we try to teach people in a manner to be mindful that everything they say is in their own best interest. And that means when a person accosts you and say, you know, oh, where do you get your protein? Or if I had to eat like that, I'd rather be dead. Just shoot me right now because if I, I, who, I'd rather be dead than have to eat that way. Who would want to live their life eating that way? Or what it, so when a person makes you feel uncomfortable, the question is, what comes out of your mouth? Are you now trying to protect your ego? Are you trying to insult them or feel better than them or superior to them? Or... Are you caring about them and think about how this is a unique opportunity to show them love and possibly have creative goodwill for their life? And when it becomes, when all that other stuff in your brain is gone and you're not concerned with how they're looking at you and how people are looking at you, and you're totally free to have goodwill, creative goodwill for them, you really do feel better about yourself. You're not, you're you're left without the, you're not conflicted and you're not guilty And you're not worried about what people are thinking or saying about you because you feel good that you are having goodwill and you've manifested your your full creativity of your brain to show them care and goodwill at the same time. And they can appreciate and maybe get something from it. And if this and the person you only have a one in a hundred chance of affecting this person positively, but that doesn't matter. What matters is you made the attempt. Just because it failed doesn't mean you didn't make the attempt. You're feeling good about yourself because you made an appropriate attempt at goodwill. 
It didn't have to have worked, but it had the possibility of working. And this is the stepping stone. It's why people, you chew mindfully, you speak mindfully, right? And you, and you act mindfully in your own best interest. And you realize that your own best interest also complements the best interests of other people around you. Because that's your own best interest too. You're no longer putting yourself at, you're no longer getting agitated. You're feeling, you know, so it, 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 leads, it helps people think about this food addiction and dabbling in addictive substances when they realize everything they do matters. It all counts. And it all helps them to be more in control of their life and not be self-destructive. You know, and I agree with you. People can learn to love the taste of whole natural food, but if they keep dabbling in the SOS and the processed food, it's like they have a foot in both worlds and they don't really enjoy either. So either you think that like me, or at least you've copied that from what I said to you in a different interview. Probably. <laughs> but I think of it like this. I think they of it always like, use the term what? foot in both worlds, you know, too. Yeah. Well, it's like doing the splits and it's like eventually you get pulled in both directions and you don't really enjoy either place very much. And it's that's right. And they're chronically under stress, always having to make a decision. Should I have that? Should I not have that? That's stress. And, you know, um, dieting is stressful and going to doctors is stressful and worrying about diseases is stressful. And you have to live in chronic fear and chronic fear shortens people's lifespan. We want people to be at peace. And you want to be at peace emotionally. And, but you can't be at peace when you're having mammograms and colonoscopies and blood tests and medical care. And you can't be a conventional human being eating conventional food, getting conventional diseases and getting conventional medical care and be at peace. You're taught, you're taught to be chronically afraid of being sick. And not only are you taking drugs that are poisonous, but, it, but, uh, but collecting medical screening tests is to a degree poisonous because it exacerbates your fear of life and disease and keeps you chronically thinking about the fear of diseases. And so the, the eating cycle keeps the medical cycle going and it has a, a negative effect on people's health, lifespan and happy and ultimate happiness. Hmm. A Debbie who's watching live wants to know, do you believe that you can overcome an addiction or is it something you just have to manage? Yes, you can overcome it. Wow. With, with time, but it takes us a lot of time, longer than most people think and longer sometimes than what I used to think. You know, so even they know with cigarette smokers, they are, you know, they're not physically addicted to cigarettes anymore after the first six months, but they're still emotionally attracted to cigarettes and can have a form of emotional addiction that can last a few years. But once they're off their cigarettes for a few years, most of them aren't thinking about smoking all the time and they don't really feel the desire to go back to smoking. And that doesn't mean that it would be good for them to try to smoke to see if they're still addicted, but they don't need to do that. And, you know, and that's really your addiction is cured. So a person who, let's say all these thousands of people that have lost more than like 50 or hundred pounds are using my program, let's say they've kept it off for years and years and years. They're not gonna go back to the former way of eating. They're satisfied with the way they're living. Maybe they still have that tendency towards food addiction had they gone back on eating junk food again, but they don't, they don't feel the need to do that. So I think that's the same as a, um, as a recovery or getting well from food addiction. It's like doctors argue sometimes, they'll say, this person got well from diabetes, their blood sugars are normal and they don't need medication, they're non-diabetic. And they say, you're just controlling it with diet, they still have diabetes. I'm saying, no, they don't. They don't have diabetes. Should they eat poorly, they can get diabetes again. Yes, just like a person's overweight. They're lost weight. They can become overweight again if they eat poorly again, but if they eat rightly, they're gonna stay at their normal weight now for the rest of their life. So certainly we want people to achieve a full recovery with no strong desire to go back into dangerous eating again. And that's a cure. Right. So Apple wants to know, what is your personal working definition of addiction? I don't know. Um, you can think about it and I'll ask you another question. I guess it means that the, the definition of addiction is the um, continue to imbibe in substances that are destructive to your long-term health and emotional well-being. Continue to utilize things that are not good for you. Even um, when you know it. Even when you know it's not good for you. Correct. Yeah. And even sometimes when you don't know it, you don't even have to know, know it. Because if you're still doing things that are harmful and you don't believe it's bad for you, it's still an addiction. Right. It could be a behavior too. Well, thank you. So Faith wrote in and said, 
I would love to know if Dr. Furman has had patients come to his center and do well, but return home to either an unsupportive environment or family, and then they struggled again. And if so, what do you recommend for people in that situation? We've been somewhat talking about that here, but yes, I mean, that, that is the key question here because almost every person, whether it's their family or their friends or their workers or their relatives pushing on you, have you not eat the birthday cake I made for you? Whatever it is, almost every person that goes home, almost every person that does this goes back and does not receive a crowd of supporters encouraging them, clapping them and keeping cake away from their, their mouth. They're trying to do the opposite. They're trying because they're food addicted people around them that are made uncomfortable with this person who's no longer sharing these self-destructive behaviors. So they're going to try to sabotage you. So you have to be prepared with the knowledge of how not to be sabotaged. And we're talking somewhat about changing your purpose and your philosophy of life, and also increasing the probability that your home environment is safe. And if your home environment where you live, you may have to have two separate refrigerators. You may have to have separate cupboards. You may have to, um, your spouse or your living partners may have to learn about this program with some type of videos or that in order for them to support you, even if they don't want to do it. We may have to ask those people for emotional support and approval even though they're not going to eat the way you are going to eat. And it's best if you don't put pressure on them to do so, but instead um, want to, to, to encourage their love for you, to support you with what you want to do that's best for your life, and whatever that means doing, to not to sabotage you. So yes, and we, uh, sometimes we have to work on the loving relationship between the partners, because in a true loving relationship, the partner at home who's not eating this way isn't trying to sabotage, but trying to aid the person trying to lose weight and get back in health. And if they want to eat something they shouldn't be eating, then they, then they shouldn't be, um, you know, tempting the person to join them. Um, so yes, all these things are to be considered and to be discussed and a plan developed to anticipate the problems before they occur. And we want people to have a definite business plan, which they implement when they go home. Right. And, and you, I'm sure you teach them what the importance is of having a clean environment or as clean of an environment as possible. Yes. And to have it all worked out. They know, they know how they're going to shop. They know what recipes they're going to make. They know what foods are going to store in their house. They know what foods aren't going to be in the house. And they know how to, how do they know how to deal with their family? They know how to compromise and show their family. They know how to express um, in a loving way what they're requesting their family to do. And a lot of times that, of course, those communications and those, um, that impact is done before they even get home. Yeah. They've already worked, worked it out. So when they go home, they're in a favorable environment and their family is supportive of them. Yeah. I agree with you. I think that is sometimes the missing piece and sometimes the most important piece. I have not worked with nearly as many people as you, but I see that as the is, is the piece that is always the reason for the recidivism. I, don't, I, I see very few people living in, an unclean, in a clean environment that just go down that rabbit hole. It's always either the social pressure and it's often usually the spouse. Yes. And, or family or grandparent. You know, I remember when I first started dating my wife, Lisa, her parents thought I was going to kill her with the way I was that she was eating. <laughs> she started eating healthy from meeting me. They said, you're going to die. He's going to kill you. They were so against me. <laughs> yeah. well, I want to show you this t-shirt. The reason I didn't wear it is I wore it last week with a different doctor, but I thought you would like it. That's yeah, it's very nice. And, and the reason it doesn't just say stop eating crap, but it specifically says eat veggies. And I want to bring up the fact that you are not, not the only doctor that recommends lots of vegetables, especially green leafy and cruciferous vegetables, but you're really one of the first that I became aware of. And maybe you could talk a little bit about why that's so important, because I don't know if this is true. But this is just something I read in a couple of books, but that green vegetables, specifically the crucifer ones have, cruciferous ones, have a compound called thylakoids that seem to be magical for helping people with food addictions. They help fight cravings. They turn off the hunger switch. They block fat absorption. And do you, you, you've said before, on, when I've interviewed you for other summits, you've said, if you don't like vegetables, you better live close to a hospital. So why are vegetables especially greens, so important to helping people with weight issues and food addiction issues. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why you're touching on some of them. Yeah, I always say that, you know, I like to ski. You know, I'm an avid snow skier. And I look at these expensive condos and homes on the side of the slope. So people who like to ski, they like to just shoot right off their house and go right onto the slope. And I'm saying people want to eat conventionally. 
and not eat vegetables, you should be like live close to a hospital, get it like a condo or a or a house with a um, right near a hospital with one of the zip line or like a or like a lift, like a. <laughs> it's funny you say that when I lived in the desert, Eisenhower, which was like the only hospital. I mean, there were everybody lived across the street from the hospital. Right. It's crazy, right? We live in a crazy world. But anyway, um, getting back to this concept, yes, there's. I'm also supporting that notion that there's actually ingredients in the food that help your body reverse atherosclerosis, reduce the detox, re help get rid of the body of, of poisons and mold, that, the, that in food that reduce angiogenesis, the promotion and the promotion of fat, growth of fat in the body, accelerate fat loss, that lower cholesterol. There are, there are compounds in food that have medicinal effects. And the compounds, and we talk about um, anti-fat storage effects of green vegetables being very powerful, but also of mushrooms and onions, and of also of flax seeds and chia seeds and of, um, and of cruciferous greens and even beans. So I, that's where that acronym G-bombs comes from. The G-bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, stands for the food categories with the most scientific support for anti-cancer benefits and lifespan enhancement. And, you know, so they do have, so certain foods, all foods are not created equal and we do need to eat um, colorful plants. And I'm also adding that in a, it's a variety of these foods that, intens that intensify the benefits. And we wanna go after more nutritional variety in our diet, including greens. So we're saying here that, let's say an Okinawan diet, a blue zone diet, eating mostly sweet potato, a little bit of pork, a little bit of fish, some pickled vegetables, is much better than the standard American diet. But it's not an ideal diet because if you look at the foods they're eating, they're not eating a wide enough variety of food. And just because they lived eight years longer than average Americans just means it's better than an American diet. And we can do so much better than, than, a, than the blue zone diets because we have so much science today to show us these beneficial foods and how to make a dietary portfolio that includes, that includes a much wider assortment of these foods that in some way works synergistically. So even with I'm um, green, green with the concept of the green cruciferous vegetables being the probably king of all superfoods, absolutely. But having plain green lettuce in your salad too, that's high in sulfoquinivos, also gives a protect, it enhances the biofilm and slows the glycemic load of everything you eat and has beneficial effects. And, have, and lettuce has almost no oxalic acids so the calcium bioavailability is so high. So in other words, I'm saying there are so many other foods we have to include in a healthy diet and not, and so to go after nutritional variety. And one thing we've learned in recent years is that to have the best microbiome with the most beneficial microbes on the biofilm and the most thickened and protected biofilm has to do with a, the variety of different nutritional foods, making sure you're having enough raw vegetables, enough raw variety and some cooked to have, and to have raw and cooked gives you better nutritional bio, um, microbiome diversity and also the types of big, huge diversity. We used to think like taking a probiotic pill by with acidophilus made from dill, or eating sauerkraut that's fermented, we're gonna increase the microbiome. But, those, but we're really finding out that the healthiest microbiome with the most beneficial effects have many a different, lot of varieties of colors and fibers and different types of plants that are chewed very well. Yeah, great. Uh, Kathy wants to know, what are your recommendations for eating out? I just tell people don't go. And she says, yes, that's the basic answer. Just don't go out. But it is a social connection. And I live alone. It's difficult to avoid sugar, oil, salt. And those, I, those chemicals are a trigger for me as an addict. Um, then all you need to do to go out is bring your own salad dressing in your pocketbook or in your pocket. So all you need to do is bring your own salad dressing. It's okay. To, you can say just you, there's either a salad bar restaurant or a restaurant that has big salads available. And I'll often go into a restaurant and look what vegetables they have available as a side. And I'll say, can you, you, I notice you have asparagus or broccolini, or could you make me that without salt or oil, just plain steamed or blanched and just put it on top of the salad? And they'll usually say, sure. The trick is also to go early about 4.30 or 5 o'clock before the restaurant gets too busy. You don't go on a Friday or Saturday night when they're during, you know, seven o'clock at night when they're going crazy with being busy and you ask them for something to make something special for you. You go to the restaurant early or an off night and you go to a restaurant that has big salads or a salad bar, or you call ahead and you ask the chef if he can make you a vegetable platter without, without, any, without salt and oil. And then you 
very, and then you um, privately, and nobody's really looking at you. You can take your little dressing, salad oil, balsamic, or whatever it is you have, I mean, walnut balsamic vinaigrette, or something you brought with you to add a little more flavor to their more bland. They don't know how to make vegetables taste great. So if you want a little bit of bring a sauce, a Thai curry sauce or something with you to add a little flavor, you can do that, but just sprinkle a little on your plate. Mm. It's, yeah. easy. it's not that hard. If you either go to the right restaurant, go at the right time, and even call ahead and speak to the chef and make sure they have no objection to making something, something special like that. Yeah. And you know, the thing is, is it, you can at least ask if you don't ask the answers. No. And I didn't eat at restaurants for 10 years, but since moving to Northern California, I have found three vegan restaurants that if I call them either 24 hours in advance or even 12 hours in advance, they make me like the most delicious food, the way, you know, no sugar. I mean, it's, and it's actually better than what all the other people are eating. And then, and then people try to eat my food. That's the problem. Yeah. But you know, one of the things problems is they, they give you a salad that's too small, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'll say to them, I want, to, I want double the salad size. And they say, well, it's a pretty big salad already. And I'm saying, no, but I want two of those. And, and I want to be charged for two of them. I want to make sure it's on the bill. You're charging me for two salads. I want to know I'm getting all that volume. And a lot of times make it bigger than double, you know, then. So I want to be, you know, it's a $12.99 salad, $14.99 salad, charge me 30 bucks. I want something big, you know. Yeah, they don't understand calorie density. This last restaurant made the food perfect but I was still hungry and I ordered another plate and they looked at me, but they, they don't understand when you're yeah, not eating oil, you know, and speaking of eating larger volumes, which is, I think one of the greatest things about the way we uh, tell people to eat, because we never have to feel hungry. There's still a group of people, even people that, that love you and follow you that believe that the only way to be successful is to weigh and measure everything, uh, you know, on a scale. And what bothers me about those groups is that I understand limiting, you know, some of the higher caloric density foods, but hmm. to weigh your green vegetables to a mere seven ounces, because they claim, well, I can overeat on that. Really? You can really overeat on, you know, plain steamed kale. Yeah. I'm agreeing with you. It, it makes people too neurotic about food too. It's too neurotic and it's too, um, you know, we should be, um, the whole goal is to eat instinctually and naturally and eat what you feel like eating. But we're trying to develop the ability so what we feel like eating is the same as what's best for us. And that takes practice and doing the right thing. And so we're trying to, I'm not giving into the, you know, oh, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel good with that. Well, you still need a little of it then. Let's see if we're going to make you digest it better. I'm going to try to, if I possibly can, or I, if I eat that, I eat too much of that. You know, we're trying to get people to eat a balanced, healthy diet. And if they do it long enough with the right amount, they can get accustomed to it and and what's consistent with that behavior it's practice any let's say super professional expert like roger federer the tennis player with a perfect swing where his belly button points at the finishing spot where the ball bounces his elbow doesn't bend till it crosses his chin where his heel comes off the back foot where he's got the perfect stroke almost with his head is on the ball after the ball leaves his head is still on that spot where it hit the ball, where the aiming spot the, the contact point the point i'm making right now is that he developed those skills with repetition and instruction to develop to, with, with paying attention with determination and repetition and practice till he got it right and after he got it right, he can run around the tennis court. He's not thinking where his head's looking or where his elbow is or whether he's keeping his arm straight. He's not worried about it. He's just playing tennis, right? He's just, it happens naturally. We want this to, we want, at the beginning, you have to pay attention to things and practice it to do it the right way, even if it doesn't feel so great. But over time, the expectation is that if you do this properly in the right balance, it should feel natural for you. It should eventually develop into the way you prefer to eat, that you love eating the most, and also works for you best. And then you're not weighing, you're not measuring, you're just kind of eating the right amount. And likewise, we shouldn't eat to a full. And I'm, it's a continual process because for example, um, look at me. I could sometimes overeat at dinner and you know they're serving a good dessert or it tastes so good, I want a second portion. I come home late at night and I feel my stomach that I ate a little too much. I'm going to bed at night. I still hadn't finished digesting the meal yet. Well, I just overate at dinner. So I learned from that. I got to watch myself a little bit. So I'm not saying that you eat instinctually, but you're also being aware of um, trying to eat the right amount and the right foods. And even somebody like me who's been healthy for so many years, I still could tendency to overeat occasionally. And I'm trying to watch. You still got to keep an eye on that. You know what I mean? Right. But 
Are you really, I, you know, this, you bring up an interesting point. If your weight is staying stable, it, mine's been stable for 10 years. And sometimes I do feel too full, but isn't it just because of the food? Like if your weight is the same, are you really overeating? Yes. You ah, are. Okay. It's not good for your health to overeat, to distend your stomach or to, um, even if you're at a favorable weight, because it stresses the body's repair mechanisms and ages you faster because your metabolism could adjust to the extra food calories, unless you totally went way amount of calories, the extra calories are still gonna speed up your metabolic rate that you didn't need. And the metabolic rate is your rate at which you're aging. So even at a favorable weight, you could be aging faster with excess food and eating to distension or fullness. And particularly eating so you're, what I, what I don't wanna do is eat so I'm full when I go to bed at night, so I have food in my stomach when I'm sleeping, I'm trying to eat light enough at dinner so I feel when I go to bed at night, I finish digesting for the night. And then I could not be perfect there, but I'm striving to get it right. So I don't eat more at dinner than I'm supposed to be eating so I can go to bed on an empty stomach. So yes. I, I, I agree with you about eating late. That's just not, a, that doesn't feel good. So, so Dina, who's watching live says, is it okay to eat bread if the flowers, like for example, she says the ingredients are rolled oats, date paste, baking powder, baking soda, shredded zucchini, plant-based milk, and applesauce, blend and bake. So is, is it okay to do something like that if the flour is not being finely ground or is bread still kind of a problem for a lot of people? It has, yeah, it has to have, even the whole wheat flour can be so finely ground. I use that Ezekiel brand bread, food for like Ezekiel bread, because it's not really flour. It's more like sprouted wheat, sprouted grains that are not as finely ground. But even that's a lot of calories. It still would be somewhat um, restricted. People just can't be eating like two slices of bread with each meal or something. They, you know, some people that are overweight don't need that many calories. So those things should be eating, eat more conservatively. So yes, I mean, with the money to be cooking something with applesauce and dates, now you're talking about a dessert food that should be probably limited. You know, that's not bread, it's a dessert because they make <laughs> dates and applesauce in there. You know, put a little, yeah. you, know. you, you really do call it like you see it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So one more question, Dr. Furman. Not everybody will have the privilege of coming to your center. And this is a, a, a problem that's difficult for people. And the recidivism rate is, is very high. So how can we give people hope to, you know, just to keep trying? Well, I think that you, um, AJ, I, I applaud you for what you're doing here and helping people um, get more knowledge to keep trying. So it's great, great you've done these things. And so, yeah, that's why I've written 12 books too. And that's why you produce videos and conferences and take and do interviews like I'm doing with you right now to give people more information, more motivation. And so they can listen to this again. They can watch some of my videos. They can read my, they can read my books. I wrote a book called The End of Dieting which talks about people not yo-yoing and then keeping trying to be consistent on it that focuses on food addiction. And I, you know, and food and fast food genocide is one of my favorite books too, but note that it did not become a New York times bestseller. You know, so some of my favorite books are the ones the public aren't going to see it as favorite because it's too thrown in their face. They would rather make a book like, um, you know, the end of diabetes would be a bestseller because so many people are buying diet books got the word diabetes in the title. You know what I mean? But actually, or the end of heart disease are bestsellers, but not fast food genocide, which is probably even more, how could you say, philosophically and intellectually challenging? You know what well, I mean? There's still hope that, you know, as people get sicker and bigger, that that book could become a bestseller. Maybe we just change the title a little to tell them what they think they want to hear in the title. I'm kind of like semi-retired now. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you seem, Dr. Furman, you seem so much calmer. Not that you were hyper before, but I feel like you're more Zen now. You know, I'm, I'm getting more sleep and more exercise. So I have a little more time on my hands. So I'm not writing books all the time into the night, you know? So I'm able to like stay in bed a little longer. And also I can do like either a hike or go to the gym or swim or bike. I can do something every day. So I'm still working, but I have more time to sleep and exercise. So I do feel a little more balanced with my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, it shows. Dr. Furman, really, thank you so much. You're always, you just, you're so kind. You're always willing to talk to me and my audience. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate your passion for this subject and your expertise, because you were really one of the first in this field to get it and to get it right. Thank you. Take thank care. you so much, Dr. Furman. And Good thanks luck, everybody. for you. Thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Dr. Christy Frunk, and she's going to be talking about the 18 best foods for breast cancer. And Dr. Furman, I'm pretty sure all your G-bombs are going to be in those 18 foods.